good to see you tonight. It's good to gather together in the Lord's name. And it should remind us that the huge numbers of people throughout this world who this day, if they have been able to meet together, it's had to be, if you like, toned down, not attracting attention, particularly where you've got totalitarian governments and the like. And we just uh, need to reflect on that, our privilege that we have this measure of freedom in this land. It isn't complete freedom. Complete freedom would probably end up with anarchy. But we have got freedom, which is a freedom tied to responsibility. And one of the responsibilities is to, in our lives, stand for the name of the Lord and to preach his word. We have two readings tonight. And the first one, I'm reading part of Psalm 118, 118, commencing at verse 5 to the end of the chapter. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Our second reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 1. Verses 8 to 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We thank the Lord for his word. 
I've intent, entitled my offering tonight for you as Is There Any Hope? The State of the Nation. I don't know how much thought, generally speaking, people give to the state of the nation. I suspect that unless something actually impinges on their lives, they don't think about it. If you listen to the advertisements, things are so rosy. You can go book your winter holiday in the Norwegian fields. Now, my ancestors, way, 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 way back, Vikings, that's where they came from. And unlike uh, the tourists, um, they weren't on just a visit. Uh, and unlike Caesar, who said he came, he saw, he conquered, and then he went home, they came, they saw, they pretty well conquered, and they stayed. So, um, they're my ancestors. Um, I have it on fairly good authority that they um, were a bit fearsome, but their neighbours were probably as well. But this idea in the world generally that what matters is how much we've got in our pocket, what the bank balance is like, where we're going on holiday. These are the priorities. And most of the people who are like this have probably only been abroad on holidays. That's all they've seen of it. And there are, as usual, the favorite tourist spots and some are more reputable than others and some are best uh, avoided altogether. But the thing is that life does not consist of us having pleasure. There's far more to life. As a child, I lived in another country, far away from here. In fact, even now, if you fly to that country, it will take you about 10 hours in one of the big jets. It's called India. And when I went to live there, it wasn't a republic as it is now. It was still part of the British Raj. The tail end of it, true. And it was a republic by the time I came back two and a half years later. As a child, I saw things there which would make most people either vomit or just pass out. And yet these were sites that were common. Now you might think I'm exaggerating, so I'm going to put your mind at rest and I'm going to tell you a terrible thing that I saw. I'm not going to embroider it in any way, I'm telling you as it was. We went to our neighbouring town once a month to do the shopping and the company always insisted that the company car was driven by the Saab's bearer. And our bearer was a very, very fine man, Bearer Joe. And we got to what was a reasonable sized town. It was called Asensol. You go to Asensol now, it's not a reasonable sized town. It's a big, big, big city. And there's a, another one just down the road as well. A big, big city. But what did we see? Well, there are certain things you have to appreciate about going to another country, and that is cultures can sometimes clash, ours with theirs and vice versa. And they can be, it can be a problem. And one of the things that has been a problem for India is what is called the caste system. 
And you can't change your caste by becoming rich and going up a step, as it were. The nouveau riche, as they had in this country. They may have come from humble background, but they were accepted because they got plenty of money to throw around. But in India, it's different. If you are born in a particular caste, that is the caste you keep the whole of your life. You cannot change. Regrettably, the people at the bottom of the pile are assumed in the Hindu religion to have been responsible for doing terrible things in their previous life because they believe in reincarnation, which is not resurrection, reincarnation. And therefore, they're at the bottom of the pile and they deserve it. So there's no feeling sorry for somebody in a lower caste. Wherever you are, it's because you've either earned it or you're getting the results of a bad life. This particular day, my mother and I and the ayah who looked after me, we'd gone to buy the ayah a pair of sandals. Now this lady was a middle-aged lady and she'd never owned a pair of sandals, footwear of any kind. And the reason was she'd cut her foot on glass. And generally speaking, the Indians' feet, I mean, they could kick a football as hard as you and I could with a boot on. Their, their feet were so tough. So for her to have cut it on glass, it must have been pretty serious. Thankfully, it didn't um, turn nasty. And my mother decided that she would buy her a pair of sandals. And in Asansol, there was a little shop. And would you believe it? It was a shoemaker. Not an ordinary shoe shop where you just buy shoes made from products that come from somewhere else. He made all the shoes he sold. It was just him, a little Chinese man, Mr. Futsun. And I can remember him to this day. And I can remember going into that shop and my ayah being bought a pair of sandals. She couldn't believe it. She didn't even want my mother to touch her feet to see if the sandals fitted. And when she went out, would you believe it, she went out barefoot carrying the sandals. Because, of course, it was very dusty outside and these were uh, something precious. At any rate, the good news is that the ayah's foot fully recovered. But on the way in, I had seen something, and it was this that shook me, and has stayed with me vividly. Even as I look here today, in my mind, I can see that thing. We got out of the car to cross the road to Mr. Foodson's shop. And there was a standpipe in the road. And what to me, as a, a four to five year old, was an enormous water tank. It was this usual sort of cistern. But to me, as a little one, it was, it was huge. And it had overflowed. A standpipe with a tap on the top. It had overflowed and round it, it was muddy water, because the road was mud, the main road. And in this muddy water, there was a man laid. I didn't realize what it was until my mother pointed it out. I don't know how it had happened, presumably through a bite or something like that, but this poor man was being eaten alive by maggots. You don't forget things like that. He didn't survive. We heard that he died the following day, which wasn't surprising. But it's this sort of thing. In this country, we have a different perception of what is important. If we need a pair of shoes, or we fancy a different 
colour of shoe or anything. We can go and buy it. We have the money. We can just go and do it. The ayah did not have that choice. She had accommodation provided. But when I say it was a basic house, it was a mud brick and mud floor. A bed, what they call a charpoy, was pretty well all she owned except for her pots and pans. That was life. And it's when I look back and see people like us are just so surrounded by things. And sometimes it gets to the stage where you're thinking, I've got this money, what can I spend it on? Those poor folk had the problem, they hadn't got the money even for food. And the food, all meals were the same, rice, rice, rice and more rice. And this is a failed harvest, you can guess what the answer is, it's a famine. Which is what happened in Bengal only three years before we went out there and millions died and Bengal was the next state to us. Asansol was virtually on the border. We can go on holiday when we want. Those folk never went on holiday. If you didn't work or didn't do whatever you were supposed to do, you didn't get your money and it was pittance what you got. So there's this total difference between different countries, different states, and we ignore this at our peril. Because in this nation, although I'm not specifically talking about money, this nation is in the most appalling mess. It's absolutely grim what's going on. It's not about economics. It's not about the prestige of the country. And just remember that even at the beginning of the First World War, we had an enormous navy. If you looked at a map of the world, uh, very large parts of the world were still painted red. Now, there's very little. We've lost the empire, and I'm not going to tonight cover why I believe that has happened. I believe there's a particular reason. But our problem is the moral and spiritual state of the nation. I'm not going to go into detail about things that I have seen in London, even 30 years ago where people were passed by and saw things going on were just looking open-mouthed. They couldn't believe that this was happening. And there was what I could call a common attitude to a lot of what was going on, and that is, it can't get any worse, but it has. And it's only when you look at today's situation and you say, What's next? It's that bad. It just seems that the country is just seeing how far into evil it can go. And it loves it. The majority love it. There's rampant sin. There are laws which have been passed which are completely contrary to what the, the word of God says. There's a rejection amongst many, probably the majority, of God's word. They don't want to know. There are churches which are debating things at great length, sometimes, you know, it's just adjourned then till the next year's meeting. Debating things which God in his word has said their sin. And they're trying to justify it. And there are many so-called church leaders who are in fact just wolves 
in sheep's clothing. The Ten Commandments. Well, at one time, the Ten Commandments, people understood where they came from. It was in the Bible. They might not have been able to tell you exactly where, but they knew that's what it was. And there was respect for them. Now, even in many churches, they're regarded more like ten suggestions. Let me tell you, friends, God's commandments are God's commandments. And anybody who doubts me, just read what it says in Malachi. I like the authorised version and the New King James version of the text of the verse. And the reason is that I think, if I could put it this way, it carries more punch than the NIV. It's in Malachi chapter 3. And it's verse 6. It just says, For I am the Lord... I do not change. I think the authorised is the stronger of the two. It just says, and I change not. And it's no good people thinking that God is just going to go tut tut and look the other way. This country has followed a terrible path. In this church, I'm grateful in the over 52, 53 years that uh, I've been coming here and privileged to stand in this pulpit, that it is God's word which is honoured and upheld. But in so many churches, that is not so. They may have a fine building, but the word... It's been altered to suit the foibles of human beings. And so often, gross error is injected. The fact is that if we reject God and his ways, there are consequences. And just to put a one-word name to it, it's called judgment. The prophet Jeremiah, and granted he was talking to the Jewish people, in his uh, prophecy, chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, you will know the words... But they're still terrible. Now this was written somewhere about 640 BC. He's talking to Israel about Israel. And he says this. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule by their own power. And listen to this. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Chilling words. The book of Jeremiah is replete with the warnings of judgment. But the foolish attitude of the people is well stated in those verses. Yes, indeed it was said to the Jews. But may I say to you, it applies to everybody. What is going on in the world around us is going on in many churches And the people love to have it so. What are they being taught 
It's the teachings of the false prophets. It's the teaching of the wolves in sheep's clothing. That last bit, and my people love to have it so. What do they love to have? They want to be free from what so many see as constraints on their supposed freedom. They refuse to accept that freedom requires also responsibility and accountability. It doesn't mean we can do what we like. Many years ago, I think it was uh, Frank Sinatra um, had a song, widely sung, I Did It My Way. And in fact, in the local cemetery here, there's actually a gravestone and it's got, as the inscription on it, the person's name, and then he did it his way. I don't know what he did, but uh, I think it's a terrible indictment that people have done things their way, and in doing it, they have rejected the ways of God. Let's be quite clear of this. I believe that God, almighty God, is the creator of all things. That he knew those who would turn to him before the world was ever created. Now that alone is, quite frankly, incredible to even try and grasp. I don't try and explain it, I just accept it. I can honestly say that God has never failed me. Never. So what about this, done, this country, the United Kingdom? A country which sent missionaries to other countries and which now is finding itself with bishops from Africa telling the Archbishop of Canterbury what needs to be done. And they're not heeded. What is happening in this United Kingdom? Well, there are two particular examples I'm just going to mention. And I'm going to preface it by saying for everybody, those here this day and those watch it on YouTube or any other platform. Just stated as basic facts and people would have to be blind to deny them. Let me tell you this. These are gross sins, but God has offered forgiveness to those who will repent and turn to Christ for salvation. The Lord God is not the God with a big stick beating us. He's offering us deliverance. And I say to you, as you listen to this, don't reject God. Don't reject his word. Don't reject his law. The two things which I find particularly problematic for this nation. The first one is the Abortion Act, 1967. One of the people who pushed it in the first place was a man called David Steele. And recently, it appears that he has said that he wished he hadn't introduced it. 
He didn't go any further than that that I heard of, but uh, 1967 the Act came in. Yes, there were abortions before that, what we call the backstreet abortions, because there were penalties for people who did it. Well, when we look and see how many abortions have occurred since 1967, the latest figures I've seen are to 2022. And it was just short of 10 million. It's over 10 million now. At that time, the population was, in round figures, about 67 million people. Over the period since 1967, we have ended up, on average, killing 10 million people out of a population of 67 million. That's win round figures in one in seven. The reason it concerns me is that the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. And when I say that people ignore the word of God, they have tried to tell us persistently that it becomes when the baby comes into the daylight that isn't what God says we find very clear indications King David talks about how he was wonderfully and fearfully made in the womb as, as a person John the Baptist it was said of him that God had his hand on him in his mother's womb. It wouldn't have been so if he was just a collection of cells, a something which suddenly becomes a baby when it comes into the open air. We have a terrible guilt to answer for all that. It's an insult and disgrace to Almighty God. The second one is the, probably the oddest law that I've ever come across. And in the election prior to this coming before Parliament, I understand that it wasn't in anybody's manifesto. Not in any party's manifesto. It's called same-sex marriage. It was introduced by David Cameron, who was the Prime Minister. And David Cameron was warned by the legal people, basically, don't do it. It's, it'll just backfire on you. But they went ahead, they did it. On the face of it, well, the two men, it's a marriage. Or two women, it's a marriage. But they've ended up with a silly, absolutely ludicrous situation. That say, for example, you had two men who had married. And they'd fallen out. And one will say he came to his senses and realised it wasn't right. And he starts going with a woman, which is a normal relationship, man and woman. The other one can say he's committed adultery because he's supposed to be with a man. And the same happens with women. And it's ludicrous. Why was it done? Well, you might say people wanted equality, but 
it was worse than that. They knew that these relationships were contrary to the word of God. God stated back in Genesis what marriage was. But they wanted to do what they wanted to do in any case. And they got the laws passed. Now, why did it suddenly just take off? Well, it's just how evil this country is. The politicians of different parties all wanted the votes. And if you had an MP who was against same-sex marriage, you'd probably vote for an opponent who was in favour of it. And the politicians were so keen to get the votes that they were virtually falling over each other to promote it. And they've got a lot to answer for. The people as a whole in this country have rejected God, uh, rejected his ways. And to them, God is irrelevant. And it is only the people who are the born again believers who know the reality of what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A lovely verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are a new creation in Christ. Those who reject God and his son, judgment awaits them. At times of elections, politicians will continue to promote all these sorts of things. And it's got to the stage now of their being concerns about the freedom of speech, even to say what I am saying today. Street preachers have been hauled up before the courts. In most cases, they've been dismissed because of the overzealous police and other people, particularly council officials. But this is what's coming. And people who don't think it will come, just look at some of the other countries, the totalitarian ones, where you've got to tread very, very carefully. This country believes that it's prospering, but it's actually descending into terrible evil. And Almighty God will not look the other way. And judgment is upon us even now. I'm sure that most Christians who are Bible believing people will be aware of two organisations in this country. One is called Intercessors for Britain, and the other is the Christian Institute. And they hold fast to the word of God. They treasure the word of God as we do here. And to the Bible teaching and to honour God. And may I suggest that they are standing as a watchman. And if anybody's in any doubt about watchmen, what they do, it's not the watchman that uh, we think of on a building site in a little hut, a brazier there and uh, dozing off during the night. No, this is a watchman in the biblical terms. And if you read Ezekiel, you'll find all that it's about. Ezekiel. But there's something going on in the churches as well. And it's not good news. And there's a verse in Amos. And it's chapter 8. 
And it says this, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. It's a long while since we had food famines in this country. And bad as it is, it's far worse when we find that the word of God, even in the supposed churches, is ignored. Its teachings are treated as irrelevant. God was talking again to the Jewish people, and he's not going to look the other way when this sort of thing happens. And the scenario then is exactly the same now. The principle is quite well stated in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. And it says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And there is a consequence. It's not about Bibles not being available that's the problem in this country. It's a rejection of God, his words, his very presence, his ways. And it's about the inevitability of God's judgment on this nation, which so, with so many churches preaching what is nothing other than a false gospel. A spiritual decline in this nation is very obvious. But there is hope. There is hope. I said at the beginning, as a title, is there any hope? Yes, there is hope. And if we look back in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, beginning verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. It's a promise. And it isn't the only one. Because we find in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, an amazing thing with the same sort of thrust behind it as Isaiah 55. And Jesus said this to the people, Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden. And he was talking about the sin. And he said, I will give you rest. He didn't say, I might, or if you're good enough. If you come... I will. So what does it mean to come? In fact, the early quote in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17 is a repetition of what it says in the first verses of chapter 3 about John the Baptist. And that was, what was the message and it said, when John came, he told the people, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And it was exactly the same message that Jesus brought. So if we put the reference in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, together with the one in verse, chapter 4, verse 17, the key thing is, in coming to him, we have to repent. And many people don't know what repentance is. And it's far, far more than just being sorry. But I want to assure you that if we come and we are genuinely, completely regretting that we are what we are, sinners, and admit that only Jesus can save us, 
we have his promise, I will come to me all who labour and heavy laden, I will give you rest. God's salvation is not something that can be earned. It's no good thinking that God saves nice people or good people. God saves sinners who have sought the Saviour. And there's no question about our works being taken into, a, into any account at all. Our works, the scripture says from the prophet Isaiah, are like filthy rags. They're not taken into account at all. What is the important thing is that it's the person. Repentance and acceptance that Jesus Christ is the only saviour. Earlier on we looked at the first letter of John and chapter 1 and as a final reference I just want to turn you to the other end of the same epistle, same letter chapter 5 and starting at verse 10 it says this it's 1 John chapter 5 verse 10 he who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself he who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is a testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. In that, it tells us of certainty. If we have the Son, we have life. If we are not Jesus' disciples, we do not have life. Secondly, it is eternal life. It's not just something for the rest of this life. It's eternity in God's kingdom. And to those who listen to this on the internet, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your own personal saviour I urge you to seek the Lord while he may be found call on him while he is near Isaiah 55 if you read it again acknowledge Jesus as the sole atoning sacrifice for sin for our sin, for my sin, for your sin. And in that repentance, receive the forgiveness from Jesus Christ. Remember, it isn't pie in the sky. This is in God's word. Jesus himself said it. He meant it. And I had to come to that place once many, many years ago in 1962. And to realise that Jesus was the only way. Don't reject God's word. If you are caught in any of these gross sins, the way out isn't on some scheme or some plan. The way out is repentance and to seek Jesus Christ and to know his complete forgiveness. The Lord bless you. Amen. Amen.